Okay, my name is Ben Pierman. And I'm Anand Kumar. And we are presenting our research on how we trained deep learning models that can see through walls using radar. Yeah. So, this is estimating hand poses and gestures through occlusions using low frequency SISO radio. Now, what that actually means is we are using a very small software defined radio called the Lime Mini 2.0. It's a small, low frequency radio with a single input and a single output antenna. Now, what's interesting about this is our carrier frequency was at 3.4 gigahertz. And in general, the lower the frequency, the more things that it can pass through. There's been a lot of research on detecting human hand poses and gestures and things like that using typically a higher frequency radar system like millimeter wave, which is gonna be between 50 and 70 gigahertz generally. So because it's low frequency, that gives it different properties like passing through pretty thick pieces of occlusion like wood and plastic. Now, we're using a type of radar called linear frequency modulated continuous wave. So in general, there's three kinds of radar. There is continuous wave, which can tell you how fast things are moving. That's what police use in their speed cameras. There is also pulsed radar, which can tell you how far away things are and the general shape and size of them. But linear frequency modulated, or linear frequency continuous wave is, uh, actually gives you the benefit of both of those things. You can get speed and you can get size and you can get shape. Now, the really important equation here that we're looking at is the range resolution of a radar system, which is essentially the speed of light over two times the bandwidth. And you'll notice that our signal bandwidth is actually very, very low. It's only 500 kilohertz. So that gives us a range resolution of about 299 meters. So that is obviously terrible. <laughs> it's really big. What that actually means is the radar system can only differentiate between two different objects if they're 300 meters apart at least. Obviously nothing here is 300 meters apart, but we were actually able to show that the radar system can still accurately detect different types of gestures and different key hand points, even with such a bad range resolution. All right, Anand, how many data sets do we have? We have two different types of data sets because we have two different problems. One is the gesture classification problem where we have three different gestures and another data set, which is the hand landmark data set. Okay, so tell me about the first data set, the, the gesture data set. How did you collect yeah, that? Yeah, uh, so for the first data set, we basically have three different types of gestures. The first gesture is uh, we ask the participants to come here, put their uh, place their arm here, and then make a fist, and then turn back into the rest position that we have. The second gesture that we have, we call it a palm gesture, uh, where the participant is asked to rest their uh, hand and then make a tilt on their hand and then come back to the rest position again. The third gesture that we have is called the pinch gesture or the tap gesture, uh, where we ask the users to basically get back into the rest position, do a pinch, and then get back to the rest position again. Okay, and so what's what's going on with this capture setup here? How does this work? So we have a transmitter and a receiver setup. Uh, one of them is transmitter, one of them is receiver, and we have a camera in between that. Uh, I'll talk about what the camera does uh, in the second data set, but uh, for now, uh, what it does is it captures your uh, data set. Uh, so there is like transmissions coming from here, and then there is a receiver that catches those transmissions or the bounce back radiations from my hand or the frequencies. And then you can, as you can see on the screen, uh, as I do the gesture, the, the donut shaped uh, thingy is kind of changing. That's because different type of gestures has kind of different types of um, shapes that, that it's gonna do. Um, it's and not so those pretty. look different depending on the way that you plot them. Yeah, exactly. It's, it might not be very prominent from this uh, setup, but when you plot these signals on a, on a Python script, or uh, even if you plot the raw IQ signals, you can prominently see that all three different types of gestures have different type of uh, fluctuations in amplitude and phase. So that's how we got to know that uh, these three different types of gestures can be accurately classified by deep learning models. Right, yeah, because in general, if a, if a human can look at something and recognize a pattern, then a machine can probably do a better job of that. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so tell us about, so what about the second type of data set for yeah. RF handmark? So for the other model that we have, uh, which we call the RF handmark model, which basically detects 21 hand landmarks on your hand, we, we first trained our models using the same data set that we had for our RF gesture. Uh, as you can see that we have a camera in between the uh, transmitter and a receiver setup, which basically records your hand while you are doing the gesture. What we do is we take this camera input and pass it through uh, something called MediaPipe. MediaPipe is basically a library from Google, which takes in a, a photo, a 2D photo, and then gives you 2D hand landmarks on your uh, on your hand, and it outputs uh, 21 uh, a size of 21 vector, which has basically x y coordinates for each of those landmarks. 
Cool. So essentially, each input example is just one frame that's been annotated. Correct. And cool. um, obviously, um, since this gesture data set was not very good or it didn't work very well, really well with uh, with the problem that we had at hand, which Be is detecting hand landmarks. And why didn't it work well? Yeah, it didn't work well because of the fact that most of these this data set had this rest position uh, and. Um, the user was kind of making this kind of gesture only for a small amount of time in that entire video. So we can say that about 80% of our data set just had this rest position and uh, only these type of uh, positions. Right. That so the model in. was just very, very overfit to that type of Exactly. Model. So in order to tackle that, what we did is we basically created another data set where we just had one participant. What the participant is doing is for the first sample, uh, it just creates a fist and then moves around this space. Uh, for the second sample, uh, the fist basically turns into a palm and then you move around this space. And then for the third part, they just tilt it and then keep it this way and then, then move it around this space. And the fourth and fifth sample is basically randomly moving your hand in the space and collecting the samples. All right, so that's the data collection. Mm -hmm. Now tell me about the model architectures. Okay, uh, so coming to the model architectures, we basically have two different models because we have two different problems at hand. One is, the first one is basically classifying the gestures, which is three different types of gestures, and the second one is uh, the hand landmark detection. Now, when you compare the two problems, the gesture classification problem is much simpler uh, as compared to the hand landmark regression problem. So we wanted to try out this SISO setup and we wanted to see how optimal is it for this type of a problem. So we started with gesture recognition where we have a model which is basically a one-dimensional, which uses one-dimensional convolutional neural networks. Um, Why is it we, 1D? Uh, so basically what is happening is we want to capture that time essence that is uh, when you perform the gesture. Okay, so you're using 1D CNN because it is good for sequential data, yeah. but why not use transformer or MLP? Yeah, that uh, is a very good question. We actually tried transformers and MLP models as well, but they did not work really well because our data set is very small. And transformer is also quite sensitive to very large fluctuations in the input vector. Yeah. And in our case, we can see that if, you know, if I move my hand really close, our amplitude explodes massively and then it drops really hard as well. We actually wanted to be able to augment this system so that it works with different levels of amplitude. Transformer didn't really appreciate that. So we were getting really crazy unstable gradients. So now tell us about the, the convolution layers here. So the model architecture is not very complex, I would say. So if we if we look at the architecture, we have uh, convolution layers, 1D convolution layers with 32 filters uh, in the first layer. Then uh, the filters kind of keep, keep on expanding uh, with the exponents of 2. We have a kernel size of 3 by 1 for each layer. But what we are doing is we are changing the, 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 the dilation and the stride for each of those layers. Why are we doing that? Because we want to keep the output of each layer constant. And we, we just want to increase the number of channels so that we can create a latent space that can be you know, later on uh, utilized by the linear classifier that we have at the end to classify those gestures. Okay, so so what's the difference between RF gesture and RF handmark? What we're doing here is we have, again, uh, an input of two by thousand vectors. Uh, and that's different. That's actually a different size. So why this is, in this case, because we're calculating frames or hand points within a two-dimensional frame, we figured that we would probably need a bit more data, which is why we're actually, uh, we increased our, or decreased our downsampling factor so that our input vector was longer, two by 1000 as opposed to two by 200, because this is a two second time period, but this is only a 0 0.05 second time period, but it's 1000 amplitude phase pairs. Yeah, and if you compare it with the first model, we are actually not using or keeping the size constant because now we need to create a latent space that can actually convert uh, our first domain into another domain. The first domain is basically our RF domain and we need to convert that RF domain or translate, uh, translate that RF domain into the hand landmark domain. So we kind of create a similar architecture to what autoencoder does. Uh, we are kind of decreasing the dimensions and we create a latent space out of it. However, uh, we don't have like a pyramid, uh, pyramid structure of a decoder, but what we do is we use that latent space, we flatten it, and then we create another regression model, which is like multiple linear layers. And at the end, you get a 21 uh, vector output with two columns, which is X and Y. Yeah, and so 21 by two to give you all the points of a hand, basically. 
All right, let's talk about the results. How did this model actually, how did both of these models perform? Well, first let's look at RF Handmark. So we didn't do the classic sort of quantitative evaluation for this since judging how good a Handmark detection model is, it's sometimes a little bit easier to just actually look at the model's output and say like, yeah, that's right, or no, that's not very good. In our case, what happened when we trained it on the RF gesture data set first was the model was really good at detecting when a human hand was there and what that hand looked like. But as Anand was explaining, our data set was extremely uh, over-representing this specific hand pose, which makes a lot of sense because the users were doing stuff like this. So and to compensate that, we used a different data set, which we ended up calling only 123 because it only contained three different samples, each 10 seconds in length, of a fist and a flat hand and a palm. And it, each, in each of these, it was moving around the frame as Anand explained. Now, when we used the only one, two, three data set on RF Handmark, we found that the model actually became very, very good at detecting when a user's hand was changing position. It's actually, its accuracy really surprised me. Now, what you'll notice is the precision is not perfect. And that actually makes a lot of sense when we go back to this, the range resolution of the radar system. As I said before, it thinks that every single thing within a 300 meter area is the same object. So what's happening here, if a hand is covering, you know, let's say maybe 30 or 40 percent of the radar's field of view, it thinks that 30 to 40 percent of the entire object, which is the hand and the area of space behind the hand, 30 percent of it is changing. It's not able to tell that object is actually moving anywhere because it thinks it's the same object. It thinks my hand is part of the desk and the wall behind it. So of course it's not gonna be super accurate at uh, detecting where in space it is, but when 30 or 40% of your object is changing, it will be of course quite accurate at knowing like, yeah, this is a different type of object. This is a hand or a fist or a palm, things like that. And you can actually see that in this GIF here. Now, when I saw this, I was stoked. This was like, we made x-ray vision. This is a four and a half centimeter piece of wood with a user doing a, it's from the test data set as well. It's a user doing the, the fist gesture. And you can clearly see that the model is able to detect the user is completely changing their hand. And in this case, the precision is actually pretty good. Like it's, it's actually pretty close to where the user's hand was. Um, you know, in all of these examples, it's gonna be like a couple inches off. But still, for a single input, single output antenna with such a, like a, a small bandwidth, it's pretty impressive. Now, let's talk about the results for RF gesture, which were much more quantitative. So for this set, we used uh, two different participants. Participant one was in the training data and participant six was not in the training data. Now each participant did three samples of all three of the original gestures. So each uh, example has nine samples total. Um, and we can see here, we also used three levels of occlusion. Occlusion level one was actually just a clear line of sight between the, the radar system and the user's hand. Level two was a 0 0.75 thick centimeter foam board. And level three was the four and a half centimeter thick piece of wood board that we saw in that GIF earlier. Now across all three levels of occlusion with both of the participants, our data set size was 54, cross set entropy loss was 0.41, and our accuracy is actually 87%. That's pretty accurate. Now, there's a couple weird things about these results. For example, you would expect that participant one would have the highest accuracy under no levels of occlusion. But actually for both participant one and participant six, we had a relatively low accuracy for a clear line of sight and we had uh, a really high accuracy for the foam board for both participants actually, and we had 100% accuracy for participant one who is in the training data, even through the four and a half centimeter wood board, which is really impressive. Now this result makes quite a bit of sense, this 66% from the uh, participant who is not in the training data uh, going through that very thick piece of uh, wood board. Now the model is actually generalizing quite well considering we only have five different people in this training data. Um, I would say that these results are pretty good. Uh, the rest of it is pretty much what you would expect. You know, the person in the data set is getting higher accuracy than the person not in the da data set. But overall, like the model is, is quite accurate and we were, we were happy with this. Now, of course, there is gonna be some caveats here. For example, we were testing this in that same, you know, 30 centimeter plus or minus 10 centimeter range. We were also um, not changing the environment that the radar system was in for the, for the test set. Um, so further evaluation would absolutely be needed to see how well this would work in different environments or at different ranges. 
you know, it's pretty easy to speculate that as the hand gets further away from the radar device, the accuracy is going to drop off. But the question is, how much can we preserve that accuracy as long as we just keep turning up the gain? And in general, if you increase the gain of a system, the directionality and power output that you're getting also increases. So you're getting more energy back in a more directional beam. However, you know, that sort of depends on, that's, a, that's an application question uh, more than a, than a raw research question, basically. But all in all, that has been our presentation. This is our work on seeing through walls with, with a radio. Thank you.